Elsie Fanwick removed the knitting needle from under each armpit, skewered the ends of each into a large pink ball of wool and placed the bundle neatly onto the table beside her. The split-second pause of the knitter's block, as Elsie called it, when the mind is suddenly free from one project and is musing on the next, is all that was needed to allow thoughts of that day to come drifting back into her head. It had been exactly one year to the day since Harold, her husband, had drowned in a freak skydiving accident. Harold's lifelong friend, Fred Grimshaw, co-founder of the Invincible Twins, was the sole survivor of their ill-fated charity jump. Fred's harrowing account as to what had actually happened up there in the sky on that glorious sunny summer's afternoon immediately following his dramatic splashdown seemed as unbelievable now as it did then. It was like one minute we were going really fast downhill and the next we were going really fast downhill but underwater, Fred had spluttered, looking visibly soaked. That thick, black, nimbo stratus cloud seemed to whip up out of nowhere. Why, if it hadn't been for my wife, Maud, winning those snorkelling lessons in Morecambe last year on that donkey derby, then we'd both be in a soppy mess now, I'm sure of it. Elsie, along with other well-wishers, thrill-seekers, anti-charity activists and local newspaper reporters, listened in stunned disbelief at Fred's incredible explanation – whereupon she turned to a bewildered young autograph hunter, whom she mistook to be a reporter from the Evening Herald, and made this heartbreaking comment into his pen. "'I don't believe it,' she said, shaking her head in disbelief and refusing to accept that the flat, soggy shape the paramedics were rolling up in front of her like a carpet was actually Harold at all. "'He had a very sound doggy paddle, my Harold did, "'and he was very good at holding his breath too, "'especially when my dicky tummy flared up.' "'Elsie craned her neck toward the heavens "'and peered up into the clear blue sky once more. "'He's probably decided to stay up there a bit longer "'and admire the view. "'My Harold does like a good view.' "'But despite her... Hopeful optimism and dogged determination to wait for her, Harold, to make a belated appearance, even Elsie had to finally admit three weeks later that there wasn't a view in the world that could keep him up there any longer. And so, after her release from hospital following corrective surgery to have her neck straightened, Elsie settled down to a life of sombre mourning and compulsive knitting— a hobby that for the last twelve months had succeeded in keeping her mind and neck free from wandering. Until now. "'I still don't believe it,' sighed Elsie, glancing over towards Maud and shaking her head in disbelief. "'It just wasn't my Harold's time.' "'Ah, time,' muttered Maud, feeling the very words stink her lips as it left her mouth, and remembering how her husband, Fred Grimshaw, co-founder and other half of the Invincible Twins, had himself died tragically only six months earlier, run over by a wristwatch repairman who was late for his next appointment. "'I used to think time was a great healer. Now I'm not so sure.' "'You should take up knitting,' said Elsie, "'timing the subject change to perfection. "'I don't think so,' said Maud bluntly "'as she glanced over to the corner of the room "'and then made a face at the life-size statues of the royal family, "'all made entirely of wool "'and leant up against the wall "'as if they were waiting for the number 25 bus. "'I don't think I could do anything on such a grand scale as that.' "'And besides, I wouldn't be able to resist curtsying every time I saw them.' Maud shuddered slightly, and then turned her attention back towards Elsie. "'What you need,' she added, giving herself an opportunity to finally broach a subject that had been nagging at her ever since she saw the advert in the local newspaper, "'is to find a happy medium instead of knitting yourself into an early grave.' "'I'm sure if your Harold knew what you were doing, he'd have something to say.' "'Oh,' said Elsie, her eyebrows raising slightly at the mention of her husband's name. "'And what would that be?' "'Maud didn't answer. 
Instead, she reached inside her cardigan pocket and pulled out a piece of folded-up newspaper and handed it to Elsie. "'I've already booked him. He's going to be here at seven o'clock sharp.' Elsie opened the piece of newspaper and frowned deeply into it. "'Mobile medium,' she read aloud. "'Want to find out what your loved one is doing in the hereafter? "'If the answer is yes, then have the dearly departed "'come to visit in the comfort of your own home. "'No messy ectoplasm or grumpy old grandparents, "'just a good old-fashioned family get-together. "'For more information or to book, call Seymour Tings "'and let him put the host into ghost.' Please note, out-of-body experiences are solely at the deceased's discretion. Elsie sat back in her chair, inhaled slowly, and then held it. If you won't listen to anybody on this side, said Maud matter-of-factly, then maybe your Harold can talk some sense into you. It wasn't the sound of Harold's name being mentioned again that made Elsie's eyebrows rise slightly this time, but a deep rumble of escaping air that seemed suddenly to shoot out from somewhere underneath her skirt. Elsie quickly fanned her embarrassment away with the advert, and remembering to breathe, she exhaled. "'Do you think that's a good idea?' But before Elsie could protest any further, the clock struck 7 p.m., and there was a knock at the door. "'I'll get that,' said Maud hurrying out of the room and accidentally knocking over Prince Charles in her haste. A moment later she returned, and pausing at the door, she sniffed the air tentatively for any last lingering remnants of Elsie's dicky tummy. Happy that there was none, Maud entered, and, striding discreetly over a horizontal Prince Charles, she ushered in their guest. Seymour Tings was a tall, slender man of about sixty years of age. His deep golden suntan was flawless, and matched only in perfection by his jet-black hair, which was swept up on top of his head in a magnificent bouffant, and then freeze-dried in place by the kind of stuff only middle-aged game-show hosts are likely to use. In fact, his snazzy black slacks, black polo-neck jumper and tweed jacket confirmed to Elsie that she was indeed in the presence of one of those kings of light entertainment. "'I'm not going to win anything, am I?' asked Elsie, wincing slightly as he flashed her a brilliant, whiter-than-white smile, and then sat down beside her on the settee. "'There's no need to be nervous, my dear,' whispered Seymour, his voice soft as silk. He took her hand in his long, delicate fingers and held it reassuringly. "'I'm here to help.' Elsie shuffled uneasily in her seat, and tried hard not to hold her breath again. "'Are you any good?' she asked, ramming her spectacles up her nose with a free hand. "'I have a gift, if that's what you mean,' answered Seymour, looking deep and unblinking into her eyes, as if he were trying to hypnotise her. "'I knew it,' muttered Elsie to herself, half expecting a young, scantily clad blonde starlet to come traipsing in through the door at any moment, pushing a hostess trolley wrapped up in a big pink bow. Uh, "'Excuse me, Mr Tings,' interrupted Maud, "'but would you like a cup of tea?' Seymour moved his hypnotic gaze away from Elsie and regarded Maud with the same unblinking look. "'No, thank you, my dear,' he said, flashing the same brilliant, whiter-than-white smile. "'The spirits are strong tonight. I think we should get started.' "'Oh,' said Maud, feeling a rush of excitement shoot up her spine, "'did you hear that, Elsie? Harold's dying to get in touch with you.' Seymour held out a long, slender arm, and beckoned Maud to place her hand in his. She did so automatically, and then sat down beside him on the settee. "'Look at that, Elsie,' said Maud, peering around Seymour, who had now closed his eyes and was facing straight ahead. "'A rose between two thorns, eh?' Elsie met her gaze and then frowned, unconvinced. All at once a quick, sharp shh shut out from between Seymour's lips, signalling the start, and then he began to rock 
back and forth, ever so slightly at first. But as the long, almost deafening silence drew on, Seymour's movements became more noticeable. "'Is there anybody there?' he suddenly boomed, as his grip on the two startled women tightened. "'Show yourself! Speak!' Elsie and Maud stared wide-eyed as Seymour's whole body then began to shake violently, as if a great electric current was being passed through it. "'Is that you, Elsie?' said Seymour, in a voice so unmistakable that it made Elsie's tummy flare up like it had never flared up before. "'Harold!' blurted Elsie, hardly daring to believe that it was actually her Harold's voice she'd just heard come out of Seymour's mouth. "'Is that you, Harold?' "'Elsie, there's something I have to say.' The sense of urgency in his words made Elsie gasp and clutch at her throat fearfully. "'Are you all right there, Harold? Is anything the matter?' Seymour's whole body was shaking so violently now that the settee which they were all sat upon actually began to move across the room with the sheer force of it. "'Of course he's all right,' cried Maud, clenching her false teeth together to stop them from shooting out onto her lap. "'Any minute now he's going to tell you to stop doing things to excess and enjoy the time you have left.' "'What happened next?' can only be described as breathtaking. Seymour, who was still shaking violently, opened his mouth and took a massive gulp of air into his lungs, causing his chest to expand so much that it actually popped the button on his tweed jacket, sending the button flying across the room to hit the life-size dummy of Camilla, Duchess of Cornwall, squarely between the eyebrows. The speed and accuracy of the shot was enough to knock the woolen royal off balance and send her tumbling to the floor, landing face down into the lap of the already prone Prince Charles. "'Elsie!' came the sudden, unmistakable voice of Harold again. "'Are you there, Elsie?' "'I'm here, Harold!' cried Elsie as she watched Seymour's chest deflate with every word spoken. "'Elsie, don't worry about me. I'm OK, and the view up here's lovely. It's Fred I need to talk to you about.' "'Fred!' cried both women at once, their mouths suddenly gaping in surprised unison. "'The guy in charge up here is getting a bit impatient. "'Fred should have been here six months ago "'and nobody's seen hiding a hair of him. "'If you hear from him, Elsie, tell him he's late.' "'Then, just as suddenly as it had started, "'the violent shaking stopped, and it was all over. "'Seymour gave one last inaudible grunt "'and then collapsed back into the settee.' exhausted. Elsie, her mouth still gaping, and with a dislodged set of dentures balancing precariously on her bottom lip, turned and faced Seymour, who, only a few seconds earlier, had been jumping around like a possessed tumble-dryer, but sat quite motionless now. The flawless tan had drained clean away from his face, leaving a pale, blotchy complexion, and his deep blue hypnotic eyes were glazed over red and had a faraway look about them. In fact, all that remained of the old Seymour was his brilliant whiter-than-white teeth that still shone out through a fixed, almost surreal smile. Maud, who had fared little better, picked her own set of false teeth up from out her lap and then shook them dry. "'Well, at least we managed to find you a happy medium, Elsie,' she gummed sarcastically, before popping the set back into her mouth and reaching for a pair of knitting needles.' 